Hello, um, I'm Kim Pepper. I'm the technical director and co-founder of Previous Next and the Skipper hosting platform. Uh, today, we have some great lightning talks for you. Um, so we're going to hear from Nick Shu, who's going to be doing some tips on improving infrastructure security. We've got Hasitha Garuge, who's going to be looking at better key management in Drupal. We've got Chris Burgess, who's doing a talk on dependency track. And finally, we've got Steve Kuchin, who's doing security considerations for Drupal programming. Um, and we hope to have some time at the end for Q&A. So please post your questions in the live Q&A tab. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. So Nick Shu is the uh, systems operations lead at Previous Next and architect of the Skipper hosting platform. He is passionate about Drupal, Kubernetes, and everything in between. So take it away, Nick. Hey, everybody. How are you going? Um, happy Thursday. So I'm going to be running through a lightning talk um, covering a couple of, uh, I guess, areas that I think that folks could improve on with their stack and just kind of start the thought in your mind about this. Um, Kim already introduced me. So I guess all that's left is my Twitter handles and my and my lovely face. So, but I'm operations lead at Previous Next, and um, yeah, my day to day is kind of covering a lot of these aspects that I'm going to talk about here. So, um, let's let's get into it. We have a lot of content to cover this session. So, um, so the first first area I want to cover is understanding interactions. So. I think um, this is a bit of a bit of an interesting area because it's about understanding what kind of traffic is coming into your stack, who's interacting with your sites. Like it's very important from a business standpoint that the business knows what features are being used, what things are, you know, like are they using the search feature? Are they contacting us? Are they falling, you know, falling off the site after thirty seconds? Like those are all important metrics. The same thing goes for infrastructure, and I don't think we do enough of this. We don't really understand what type of interactions actually happen, like who's consuming our website, who's viewing our website, um, what kind of, is it a bot, is it a person, which kind of leads me into my first lovely graph. So what I want people to do is go away and think about how they're kind of analyzing their traffic in a very simple way that, um, that'll show what kind of uh, what kind of things are hitting your website? Um, by setting up these uh, four graphs, we were able to quickly, like with AWS Bot Control, this will be using AWS. Sorry, as kind of an implementation um, example, this is what we do, and these are actually real graphs. But um, but in a couple of dashboards and using AWS WAF and Bot Control, we're able to quickly see you know, what ratio of the site is bots, what's real users, what kind of interactions are happening. Is it, you know, a search engine going to the website? Is it an actual client? Um, and this is very high level, but it, but it can go deeper. <laughs> I thought this was super, super interesting. Like when we turned this on and then you could see like, oh, WhatsApp or Applebot or, um, I think Facebook's in there. There's a bunch. Like that's a lot of stuff. Like I, it's, and I thought this was very, very interesting. And it's very, very interesting to know what kind of things are hitting your website out of kind of the standard standard interactions, because this kind of leads you to have a greater knowledge and be able to understand if things are good, if things are bad, should things be blocked, what should we what should we be doing, or is there a demographic that we should be also considering in the future. So that's kind of at the top of the stack. Um, the next one down is about locking down code. So, um, so we've compiled our, you know, our Drupal site, or we've deployed our Drupal site, and now we want to make sure that that is the that's the truth. We don't want things to change. Gone are kind of the days of running Vim on an app server or a web server somewhere and changing settings.php. Um, we really need to be able to understand the artifacts and the applications that we're shipping to ensure that, that things are okay. Um, here's an implementation of what we've done on our Skipper hosting platform. Um, this is read-only containers. So the idea is that um, developers can't change code, but hackers can't change code. Nobody can change the code. Um, Fun fact, this is actually a, a feature that I helped contribute to Kubernetes. So this is kind of my my one um, that I'm very proud of. 
but um but this is very important because in the case of you know like a, a drupal get in or something like that bots can't go and edit your ht access file and start mining bitcoin and making money so um so there's also that aspect too so um so if you want to continue down this path i highly recommend you either chat to your your ops team and and consider how how your code's been handled is it is it permissions or is it containers in the same vein we have um, intruders being able to detect intruders so um, this is something that i think has really started to come up a lot with the cloud native ecosystem and mainly in the form of the falco project so so not only do you need to make sure that your code can't be changed um, you also need to make sure that things aren't executing bad commands on your infrastructure so um, I think just the reality of a of an application like Drupal is that that you do have to shell in once in a while. You need to be able to run Drush. You need to be able to run cron tabs. Like if a deployment fails, maybe you need to run a config import again or update DB or clear caches. Like there's there's a whole slew of things that you need to be able to do, and you can't just turn off the command line for um, for developers to to block this problem out. So. So the next best thing you can do is have a layered approach, not only just have a read-only um, code base, but also um, have some monitoring around what commands are being executed and when. So then you can have some kind of audit trail. In this case, I'm using Falco. And um, here's a really cool example of uh, something that I didn't know. So so in this example, the so I guess to start from the beginning, Falco is configured to log um, commands that are executed within our containers, and then it just logs it logs it out to stand it out. It just logs it. Our logging system picks it up, and then we can query it. Now, for the longest time, I, like I've been using New Relic for you know uh, many many years, five, six, seven plus years. Uh, awesome, awesome APM software, but um, I had no idea that it was running a daemon until I deployed a bit of software like this and went. Oh, it's not just a Peckle extension, or it's not just an extension. It's it also executes and fires off a daemon, which makes a lot of sense. But you just don't know those kinds of things if if you're not kind of in the trenches and seeing what's going on. So in this example, this is kind of just highlighting the fact that you should be able to audit what's being executed on your environment. So then you can put your hand on your heart and know that you know things haven't broken through certain barriers in your infrastructure and people are running the right commands on your infrastructure as well. And for my final one, uh, which is a bit um, uh, contentious, maybe, I don't know, for some people, others um, might have already drunk the Kool-Aid I sort of have, it's managed services or more specifically managed cloud services. Look, at the end of the day, um, if you're hosting infrastructure or deploying an application or you're building a product, you could say at the end of the day, you know, we're just hosting a Drupal site, but you are like your product is the infrastructure that your developers use. And if you go ahead and deploy MySQL and like, you know, and a, and a firewall and a caching layer and all these kinds of things yourself, there are definitely trade-offs. And one of those is security because it's, you know, a small set of eyes versus what I would arguably say is this is this is the product page for AWS. And what I would arguably say is, you know, a much superior company to shipping products and managing, maintaining them and then um, running audits. And there's there's a lot more eyes on this versus your, you know, bespoke MySQL configuration. So anyway, on that note, it's a lightning talk. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so moving on. Next up, we have um, Hasitha, Better Key Management in Drupal. So Hasitha is uh, a PHP and .NET developer for the last 15 years and has been involved in many small to large scale Drupal projects from version four to nine. Uh, he's currently working as a Drupal engineer at the city of Burundara. Take it away, Hasitha. And yeah, it's a um, good afternoon all, right? Uh, uh, my topic is um, securing integrated systems with a better 
key management process in Drupal. So I'm sure uh, most of you or some of you are familiar with um, key management um, situations in Drupal or opportunities, what are the ways we can manage keys, so handle um, keys. So I'm just going to briefly um, like start um, what are the available options in Drupal. So um, there will be a poll um, going on. Um, so it's asking you a question like whether you have um, ever hard coded um, your keys, secrets in Drupal or any other uh, platform at least once in your developer life. So just feel free to uh, pick yes and no uh, based on your experience. I'm guilty. Uh, I have done in that past. So yeah, um, that's that's how we learn, right? So um, I guess most of the developers have done that mistake before. So um, when it comes to things we are handling with um, integrated systems, it comes to keys, secrets, certificates, um, sort of things. So these are the possible ways, even though they are they can be bad or they are available. So anyone can hard code um, secrets, keys, anything in code. And then you can store in database and then do a database query and get the keys or secret from database. I know all these are bad things. And then you can hard code these things in uh, environment file. So you know the .env files, you have these files specific to environments, local environment, separate file, and then for dev environments, UAT or production environments, there are separate files. And keep these key secrets in these files. And then hard code in settings.php when it comes to Drupal specific ways, you know, settings.php, you can have separate PHP settings files uh, for each environment if you need, or at least for local. So you can hard code these things in um, there. And then another way of doing that is storing files. Say for an example, you're creating a small text file or whatever um, with the key and then access that file and get that key while you are accessing the third party integrated system. And then another way um, Drupal introduced is um, configurations, right? So um, we can store these keys or secret certificates with Drupal configurations as well. And then the other one is server environment variables. You can keep these variables um, in server as environment variables and then access those server environment variables when you are in that server environment. And the last one is storing your key secrets in a third party keyboard kind of thing. So um, definitely maybe some of you have done that, um, like you have different solutions like Azure is providing, Microsoft Azure is providing Azure Key Vault and uh, AWS is providing their solution and things like that. So there are third party providers um, giving you uh, opportunity to store your keys securely and access uh, whenever you require. And on top of all these, you can secure these additionally with some encryption method, right? So when you are storing your keys, definitely you can encrypt these keys or secrets and then use some, some sort of decrypt um, algorithm to decrypt them when you are using to connect uh, with the third party systems. So the other one um, is like, what are the available um, methods, especially in Drupal uh, or modules available in Drupal to support this um, key management? So there will be another poll um, coming up, I guess. Um, so that is asking you a question, um, have you ever used um, key module in Drupal, um, there is a separate module called key. Uh, most of them or some of them have, must have used it. And um, that's one of the uh, best modules I have seen uh, to manage keys. So my topic will be mainly about that. And um, I'll be 
discussing uh, what are the available modules and then finally um, what's available in key module. Um, so as you suspected, uh, my first preference, that's the key module. And then there's another third party uh, provider called Locker. So you can find this Locker and it's a third party provider like Azure Key Vault or something. You can store your keys with the Locker uh, module and then access from Locker whenever you need them in your application. And then um, Townsend Security Key Connection, this is another provider uh, providing key management and actually Key Vault. Um, so this is one of the custom modules um, I built and contributed to Drupal. Um, so this one is connecting with Azure Key Vault um, and get the Key Vault keys um, or secrets uh, for you in your Drupal application. And there's another one, API Key Manager and HashiCorp, if you know already, and on top of all these things, Encrypt. So there is a module called Encrypt and you can use that Encrypt module to um, secure your keys or your data inside Drupal, any sensitive data in your Drupal instance are uh, more secure. And there's another Encrypt KMA. So it's um, using the Encrypt module and it's providing more functionality. So um, I'm next going to discuss what does key module provide. So that's my main topic exactly because that's one of the best uh, modules I have ever seen um, in Drupal uh, when it comes to key management. So key module has three sections exactly. One is key providers. So with the default module, like with the key module, it's providing three default methods. One is configuration provider. So you can basically keep it in Drupal configuration with the configuration provider and then environment. So as I mentioned before, you can keep it in your environment variables um, with this environment provider and then the file provider. So with this method, you can easily store certificates or anything like private public certificates or anything in a file and use this provider to manage. So then the next option um, key module provides is the key types. So when it comes to keys or secrets or certificates, there are a few different types, right? So we know there's authentication, one username, password can be, and then maybe authentication again with multiple values, maybe few passwords or something, or maybe more than username and password and another third variable. And next one is encryption. So it can be a encryption, uh, decryption kind of thing. And then um, it's use password things. And then the other is providing like key inputs. So according to these key providers and key types, it's offering these few types of key inputs. So one is none. So for an example, if you selected the key provider file, you don't need to input any keys because it's a file selection from your server space or somewhere. So you can select none or else if you are generating an encrypt key, you can select generate and then you can select text field if you are adding username or password and things like that. And finally text area use multiple values. And also key config override. So this is one of the um, main feature in key module, you can override the config of any key. For an example, um, say you, you are doing a custom module and you are creating a separate um, username password area in that custom module and it is storing in the Drupal configuration. But with this key config override feature, you can basically override that configuration and store them in a third party key vault or somewhere easily. So that's the uh, benefit of that. And plus all, uh, on top of all these, you can extend the key module with your own providers, key types or key inputs. That's the best. And um, what are the extensions available? So uh, these are the extensions available at the moment. So local, as I mentioned before, you can use alone 
as well as you can use it within the key module. So Locker is providing an extension to key module and then Townsend AKM is providing another extension. And then um, Azure Key Vault, the module I built, it's providing another extension. You can use it, Key Vault, uh, the module uh, alone to use the Key Vault and get the keys and everything in code. But if you need a UI um, user interface to handle all these keys in Azure Key Vault, then you can use that on top of the key module as well. And then asymmetric keys and things like that. So, yeah, and um, I'll be quickly finish it off and the benefits of the key module. Um, these are the benefits. So everything, all the keys in your Drupal solution, you can just manage it in one location and you can store in configuration, environment, file as mentioned, and third-party cloud services. And on top of all those, configure or right? Those are the best options we have. So thank you. And um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer in our last um, few minutes of um, Q&A session. Thank you. Uh, these are all quick lightning talks. We're gonna get through, <laughs> get through them all. So we don't have a lot of time to talk. Uh, next up is Chris Burgess. Uh, Chris is exciting, excited to be, he's exciting, and he's also excited to be working um, in open source software, sharing knowledge and, and still learning after 20 plus years in open source. 15 of these are in, in the Drupal community. He's a senior developer with Catalyst IT. Take it away, Chris. Uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou, ko Chris Burgess tōku ingoa, uh, kia ora. Um, I'll turn it up to 1.5 times, okay? Um, I'm a developer with Catalyst, I uh, live deep south in beautiful Otipoti, and I'm really excited about building Drupal projects in our community. I'm Zerizem on most places online, except for my Drupal Git handle because of CVS transfer. Um, so... We like components. Uh, Drupal projects can be complicated. Staying on top of updates is a requirement for system and data security. Understanding our projects happens at lots of different levels, from the forest to the weeds. Um, we like components because we can build complex things. It means understanding the components we're using. And most agencies, most organizations have a bunch of projects with a bunch of pro components in them. Um, so there's lots of advantages to understanding this, but security is one of the biggest. Um, so years and years and years ago, Catalyst announced Archimedes at a Drupal South like this one, quite different actually. Um, and then we turned that into Mata'ara, and today we're looking at other ways to review how we're using all of these components. Um, Composition analysis is a tool which lets us understand what all of those pieces in the pie are. Um, for a Drupal project, you can have hundreds or thousands of packages in your dependency tree, especially once you consider that you've got other packaging systems in place, such as NPM for the theme or front end. Um, you've got frameworks and containers in the operating system and possibly firmware. I don't know what you're building. Um, so what are we running? What else is running these same things that we're using in different projects? And how can we consolidate those and reduce uh, the number of things that we need to think about? Um, what vulnerabilities do we need to care about? And also what license considerations do we have for different projects? Um, licenses do matter. And depending on what you're building, they can have a really big impact on what you're able to do or what you're able to use. Dependency Track is an OWASP project that uh, provides software composition analysis, and I've been looking at it to see whether it fits the bill for what we want to do. Um, currently, version 436, it's a Java application. You can run it up in um, Docker to give it a spin. I ran a demo copy up on Catalyst Cloud. Catalyst Cloud. Yay. Um, nice and easy, and yeah, had a bit of a play with it, but we've been using it as a prototype as well for um, some real-world projects. No real-world data today, though. Um, so how it works is you take your composer.lock or your composer um, composer lock and JSON, um, your package lock uh, from Node, maybe your gem file.lock from Ruby. Um, all of those different software systems have locking mechanisms that allow a 
build to record what's in it. And we can take that and turn that into a bill of materials, which is a common format, um, a BOM, bill of materials, BOM, um, that allows us to communicate with, you know, interoperate between systems about what went into that build. Um, so you can pull it out from your CI or you can manually upload it and extract it. You can also combine bill of materials between packaging systems together to comprehend all of the different packages that have gone into building a single project. Um, so you want to aim for automated inbound data, but you can test it out with manual, manual imports and manual compiles. Um, you can import that into dependency track, which will analyze and extract the metadata, the versions, the licenses, and it will also haul in uh, vulnerability databases that it can match your components against. Um, so it sources that vulnerability intelligence externally, you can retrieve from public and licensed systems, so you can pull in from some of the more expensive or um, yeah, restricted uh, databases. Um, you can configure dependency track to apply your organizational rules over the top of this. So um, tell me about unlicensed components that exist in this project. And what does it mean for us if we're pulling in something that doesn't have a license applied at all? Um, send me a report on Slack, Teams, whatever, um, when something comes up with a vulnerability and which projects are affected. So what do you get out of the box? This is the front dashboard of dependency track. You get a snazzy dashboard that will report all on all the scary things for you. Um, this is the same dashboard, but bigger. Um, this is the projects view. Um, so we're looking here at a particular project, project one at version 0.01. Um, it's a composer Drupal and NPM project. And we can see that we've got some vulnerabilities identified. Um, and we've got, yeah, some audit, audit notifications coming up as well. We can dive in and explore the components that make up this project. You can see here that there is a medium or high level warning on one of the three versions of Acorn that Node has managed to pull in. I don't understand how it got three versions. Hey, um, you can review your vulnerabilities in more depth, such as this handful of multi-medium spicy NPM vulns. Um, and you can look at policy violations. So here's a list of all the components that didn't have a license and it's telling us, go sort that out. Um, what does this mean for us? So it means that we can have early advisory of vulnerabilities and not just from the Drupal components, which is what you can get from Drupal at the moment. Um, com uh, Drush, yeah, anyway, there's, there's some Drush commands which will help with that too. We'll talk about those in a moment. Um, yeah, okay, cool. Interesting, I've got the wrong notes here. I'm confused. Um, let's talk about that. So we get consistent assessments across projects. We get our, um, a reference for developers so that they can look at the other components that we're already using in different builds, which may help you as an agency if you want to avoid a divergent spread of components being hauled into new projects um, and give people visibility on what the other approaches that the same company or organization has been up to. Um, gives you an additional review step that you can firm up your processes around selecting components. Um, and it gives you automated analysis over time. So not just when the changes are applied, but also if a vulnerability drops on one of those packages um, that you're using, you can find out about it quick smart. Right, so what else is out there? Um, in your CI pipelines, you might be using things like Composer Outdated or Drush PM Security to identify known outdated components in that space. And you could be using NPM audit alongside that. Um, there are also paid services such as Tidelift, which uh, offers additional support. They will help you curate your packages and tune for the appropriate licenses for your systems. And they'll go off and do the work of identifying when there's a missing license in a package, which can be really useful. They are a paid service and um, they are really engaged in supporting maintainers by contributing back the paid service income to maintainers of projects. So they're really interesting to check out. I'm quite impressed with what they're doing. Um, they're doing cool stuff around funding open source, and I like that. Um, 
And there's probably some other things too. So I don't have a poll, but I would love to hear what other people are using to fill the same knowledge gaps or informational awareness um, in their organizations. Looks like that's it. I've got a minute and a half left. Um, yeah, say hi. Um, there is on everywhere, um, most everywhere. And that's me. Someone else can have a minute and a half. Go. Take me off screen. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> okay, so uh, we are very tight for time. We won't have time at the end of the Q&A, but please join us in Drupal Slack for any follow-up questions. Um, look forward to that. Um, so finally, the last lightning talk of this session is Steve Kuchin uh, on security considerations for Drupal programming. Steve has a strong background as a developer with over 20 years industry experience. He's worked with companies, startups, and profits of all sizes. And Steve is currently a developer advocate at SNCC. So here's Steve. I've been developing uh, apps for a number of years now through digital agencies, um, even through uh, being a, a developer advocate or developer evangelist through a whole bunch of companies doing all sorts of fun things from e-commerce to oh, one of my favorites, IoT. You can always uh, integrate IoT into anything. It's great. Anyway, I've been uh, built out a number of applications over the years. And well, using something like Drupal, for example, I've always loved because, well, it's got so many great features straight out of the box that are really easy and quick to deploy. Even going back to my digital agency days, like building out applications, um, application sites, campaign sites, whatever, as part of uh, digital agency experiences has always been super quick and super easy. But something I've always pondered as part of my, uh, what I like to think of as my developer origin story is just what nasty, what things are lurking inside the platforms that I'm deploying. Now, particularly when you think libraries and dependencies with the likes of Composer, et cetera, when you're deploying stuff, there's usually a whole bunch of dependencies that get pulled in as part of library support or as part of different frameworks. And indeed, there's been times where like I've had to go back and clean something up because you know, there's all sorts of nasty pop-ups and whatnot appearing on sites. And even some of the code that I've used in the past uh, for various projects, which I mean, at 2 a.m., it seems like a good idea at the time, next minute, yeah, you've got a compromised app. So I thought we'd go through some of the ways to make, um, to help secure coding. And I'd, given that Drupal is built on PHP, I thought we'd go over some common PHP ones first. Now, some of these you probably already know, it's probably just a good reminder, if anything, if you do. Uh, if you aren't aware of some of the uh, security nuances to some of this stuff, then um, yay. <laughs> um, these four in particular are ones that I've always been extremely wary of with good reason. And I mean, it's, it's common sense is uh, EXE, for example, in um, EX, uh, exec in uh, PHP, for example, uh, gives your code or gives PHP access to your core operating system. So this is definitely one, well, you want to use very sparingly, if at all which is generally how I've always approached any of these four um, functions before, or any of these four base language PHP uh, routines before, is any time that I've considered using any one of these, the first thing I ask is why do I need this and is there another way? <laughs> um, and rightly so, as I'm sure you can imagine, like giving code direct access to your, op your operating environment not a great idea. <laughs> There's all sorts of uh, dragons that can be hiding inside that. So ultimately investigate if you need to use any of these. And I mean, you can use things like cron, for example, to try and run batch jobs or um, sanitize um, image manipulation, for example. And that's potentially one of the things I've looked at using this sort of stuff for in the past. Anyway, use these ones extremely sparingly. So something we've seen in recent years is uh, with some of the sanitization functions like strip tags or even the conversion stuff like MB uh, string to lower. Um, strip tags only filters uh, HTML. So JavaScript and SQL are completely valid in its eyes, which as you can imagine, there be dragons. <laughs> HTML entities, for example, is a good option. It won't sanitize completely, but you can use uh, definable UTF character sets. Uh, MB str uh, string to lower, it basically uh, can raise a whole bunch of out of bounds by UTF character sets. 
which is why um, it's definitely one to avoid. Preg replace um, is always a good way to, particularly with sanitization or conversion, is a good way to transform or sanitize strings uh, if you need to. But I mean, one of my favorites to use lately in um, base PHP is filter var, which is you know, kind of the standard at the moment. And you can actually add to this as well using filter flag, strip high, that like is a whole bunch of really nice filters that you can use as part of the input output with the filter var uh, option. So definitely one to look at. What I'm gonna really, really, really emphasize on here, and we're gonna talk about this one in a moment when we switch over to Drupal secure coding, is unserialize. Yes, not only is it grammatically uh, incorrect, I think I can, that was a good combination of uh, wordage to use, um, but also extremely, extremely insecure. And I can't stress this one enough because serialize uh, actually isn't too bad. There, I said it. Unserialize is kind of the the bad of the worst of the two. The bad of the two. The worst of the two, because you can in serialize you can actually store functions as part of like a serialized variable set. You can actually store a function which can then be pulled back out and well executed on your system as part of like a remote code execution. So. Unserialize is extremely bad, so much so there is a whole big warning inside uh, the PHP documentation for it, which is why, one of the reasons, many reasons why you shouldn't use it. Uh, but also the core developers themselves from the core PHP team actually won't consider uh, any vulnerabilities or bugs raised against Unserialize now as being a, a security issue because it's so unsafe and you shouldn't use it. I kind of wish it would get taken out. But um, anyway, if you weren't already aware of why you shouldn't use it is literally because uh, a remote attacker can use this particular function potentially depending how you're storing your uh, variables, how you're storing your data sets or user data inside serialized and unserialized, they can use that to basically run remote code on your server, which I mean, nobody wants that. Um, this one actually is so bad too that the uh, Drupal security team have had issues with it in the past. And shout out to the Drupal security team. They do amazing work and are extremely reactive in keeping up to date with any CVEs or security instances that are raised and very quick to patch things. So yeah, love, love the Drupal security team. Um, incidentally, if you're not already subscribed to the, uh, the alerts that they put out, I would highly recommend to do so because uh, ultimately, these apps that you build and support to keep your users safe. So please keep your users safe. <laughs> um, onto, uh, now that we've gone through some of the PHP stuff, onto Drupal secure coding. So of course with Twig templates, uh, anything between double curly brace is sanitized. It does get sanitized. And as devs, we always sanitize everything. Sometimes multiple times just to make sure because you can never be too sure, right? <laughs> Um, some ways to do some really nice sanitization. So um, there's a couple there on the screen. You're probably already familiar with some of these. So HTML escape, uh, that just outputs plain text. XSS filter strips uh, HTML tags out. And XSS filter admin, it basically allows HTML only for admin users uh, if you need to do so. Um, Drupal eval, I'm just going to mention it here. Uh, it, I'm pretty sure it's not in Drupal 8 or 9. Actually, I know it's not in Drupal 8 or 9, but Drupal 7 uh, does still have it. So if you haven't yet upgraded to 8 or 9, which I know you're totally going to because it's almost out of support or everyone's being encouraged, of course, to upgrade and you should totally upgrade. Um, but this is based on PHP, uh, EXE, and eval, and all those nasty dragon things that we were talking about a moment ago. So please upgrade as soon as you can. Um, some other things to remember, particularly around the database storage side of things. Uh, when storing data, the database layer works on top of the PHP PDO and uses an array named placeholders. Um, of course, uh, the, to make sure, always make sure that you correctly sanitize user input. But of course, you already know that because I just did two slides telling you why that you should sanitize and every like, everyone should know it anyway. Sanitize, sanitize, sanitize. Um, there's a re actually a really good, speaking of sanitization, there's actually a really good write-up on why you shouldn't trust form input variables. And it goes back to our, um, our old friend, Unserialize. 
Um, there's also some decode entries in Drupal 7 as well that you should uh, take a look at, but check out the Drupal docs on uh, security and sanitization because there's some really good uh, write-ups on there as well. Um, just be aware of Checkplane. There's a couple articles on this actually, but Checkplane um, uses client browser to provide additional or temporary sanitization. Um, we've seen from the security side of things, we've seen some um, incidents involving browser side uh, sanitization recently. So just be careful using that. Again, I would treat anything that you're um, potentially concerned about on the security side of things lightly. And remember to just always make sure you're pen testing stuff and testing things where you can as well. Ultimately, think like a hacker. If you can get around it, they can get around it. So always, I always love taking that approach. I'm going to do a quick talk on a quick mention on containers because I know that's a big thing at the moment too, which um, essentially a lot of the top 10, well, a lot of the um, Docker base images that we find these days on um, Docker Hub basically contain a whole bunch of vulnerabilities in them based on um, you know, open source li library components that we know have open vulnerabilities currently in them as well. So always make sure that you're checking and scanning your container types. Um, the way I like to think about this is with great containerization comes great responsibility. Oh, I always love that, that meme. Um, no, this also goes back to making sure you keep those end users safe because ultimately that's who we are building these apps for. We need to protect their data, need to protect their experience. A good example of that, and this is the Drupal base image on Docker Hub, as you can see, it has over 100 million uh, downloads to date, which is amazing. Um, but again, like make sure you're scanning, doing some base scanning on those images to make sure if there's any open source components in there that need to be upgraded, that you're getting those upgraded because again, users need to keep them safe. That's about all I've got time for. So um, just lastly, please always use your tech superpowers for good and be excellent to each other. Thank you very much. Everybody, so we ran over by a couple of minutes, but um, I surely agree they're all great talks and we managed to um, to cram them all in. So yeah, enjoy the rest of your your uh, Drupal South shorts. <laughs> so.